All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to talk about the circle and the hyperbola today. We're going to parameterize the circle using standard techniques in multivariable calculus. Then we're going to parameterize the hyperbola. And when we're working with the hyperbola, we're going to introduce a new vector product, a new way of taking two vectors and combining them together uh, that's sort of an, an analogous to the inner product. Okay. And once we've got the two geometries, we'll draw analogies between them. Okay, so first, let's look at the circle. Right, so this is the usual circle uh, that we all know and love, right? We, we've got x squared plus y squared is 1, right? Totally standard unit circle, so our radius here is 1. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a formula that describes a moving point on this. So if we had a point somewhere on our circle, and we wanted to call that p of t, we'll describe how that variable t relates to positions on the circle. Okay, so we're going to give a parameterization. All right. So p of t will be our parameterization, and it's going to have two components, x sub t and y sub t. And we'll come up with formulas for these as we go through this. So we'll start off with our circle. We'll implicitly differentiate. That gives us 2x x prime, 2y y prime. And notice that this is really uh, sort of an inner product, right? We've got uh, these two products that we're adding together, and we can rephrase that whole thing as an inner product of two vectors. Right, so we cancel the twos, and we get here. So p and its derivative must be orthogonal. Okay, so there are orthogonal vectors with respect to the usual dot product. I'm going to keep pointing out the usual dot product, because in a couple minutes we're going to see a uh, sort of a non-standard dot product that might look sort of surprising. Okay. So, if we've got that these things dot out to zero, then notice what has to happen with them, right? Somehow, these guys have to multiply together and cancel out these guys, right? So, what we need is we need a negative sign in front of the y term here, right? So we've got some negative sign to make these guys cancel out. Right here we can put a plus one. Okay, now if we've got two vectors that are orthogonal, p and p of t, then any stretch of p and p prime will wind up being orthogonal as well, right? So we can stretch this by any factor we want. And when we stretch that vector, we're still going to get something orthogonal to p of t. Right, so what we can do is we can introduce a scaling factor that'll keep track of that stretch. Right, so we're going to call that factor lambda of t, so that we can stretch any amount that we want and still remain orthogonal. So we're going to nail down what uh, this parameter has to do if we want to be unit speed. So if we've got unit speed, then we have the following with respect to our usual dot product. So we multiply these out according to the dot product. We notice that we can bring out this copy of lambda. Right, that guy will come here. Everything here is going to add up to 1. 
So at the end of the day, all we're left with is an absolute value of that lambda t. OK, very nice. So we know that lambda t has to always be uh, 1 in absolute value. If we're going to be unit speed, lambda t must be 1 or negative 1. We're going to choose the optimistic route. We're going to say that lambda of t always has to be 1. OK. So far, so good. So just to kind of refresh what our picture is, right? we've got this unit circle, and we're walking along this unit circle uh, with speed 1. OK, so our parameterization p of t has the property that it is always speed 1. OK, and that forces a particular choice of lambda on us. OK, lovely. So from this definition now, uh, we get a particular property of the derivatives of our function. So if we've got a parameterization of unit speed, then it has to satisfy these derivatives, right? We've got that. Um, x prime has to be negative y, and y prime has to be x. And we can use this to get all the derivatives of x and y. Okay, so we start off with the derivative of x, the derivative of y, take derivatives again, and again, and again. And notice that the, the, the pattern closes up here. Right now we're back to our original parameterization p of t, right? So this pattern is going to repeat every four terms, right? So our derivatives are repetitive with uh, pattern four. And this is the kind of thing that you would get if you just looked at um, Taking the derivative of each one of these, you get the next one, and it would close up after four repeats. Okay, so we're almost at an actual representation of these functions. We almost have enough information to get a power series representation for them, right? We know the derivatives to all orders, but we, we still need a little bit of more information. We're almost at a power series representation, okay? What are we missing? We're missing an initial point. Okay, We're missing a place for our parameterization to start off. So we'll pick a nice point on the circle. We'll pick the point 1, 0. Right? From that, we take our power series. We now have a value for all of the derivatives of this function. Right? Doing a bit of algebra, we get here. And notice we've only got the even powers of t. Right? And if we think back to our first year knowledge, we've got alternating sum, only even powers of t. Right? So we ask, OK, well, what function could this be? Right? Take a moment. Think to yourself, what function could this possibly be? parameterizes a unit circle. Right, so we've got a point on the unit circle that's moving around. It starts at 1, 0. It's headed in this direction. So this function has to be cos of t. Right? Our usual parameterization of the circle is going to be cos of t sine of t. So we have to get that x is cos. 
Okay? And this gives us a very natural, nice derivation of the power series of Coase. We get it from the geometric properties of the circle. All we've used so far is implicit differentiation. Okay. Very nice. Right, so we get cos and sine. Just as a bit of a question, what would happen if we had chosen a lambda as negative one? Or if we had chosen a point that wasn't one zero? Okay, so try and answer that. We'll uh, post our answers online and see what we can get. Okay. So there's our parameterization of the circle just using uh, implicit differentiation and a bit of first year calc. Right, so what's going on? We've got point on here. X of T, Y of T. It's headed off at unit speed. And we wind up getting a particular formula for uh, what its power series has to be. Right? So we get that this must be cos t and this must be sine t. And just one other property that I wanted to point out that we used was that uh, this um, the, the derivative vector is going to always be orthogonal with respect to the standard inner product to um, the position. Okay, so if this is P of T, then this will be P prime of T, and they'll always form a 90 degree angle, they'll always be orthogonal uh, with respect to the standard inner product. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why that's important later, but I just want to point out that there's an orthogonality relationship here. Okay, so now we'll move on to the hyperbola. Okay, we're going to go through the same procedure. Uh, we take our hyperbola, right, that's a curve that looks like this. And now we're going to do implicit differentiation on it. Right, we take our curve, implicitly differentiate, and now we're going to say, imagine that this is an orthogonality relationship. It's not exactly the usual inner product, but it is sort of analogous enough for us to define what we're going to call the circle product. So we take AB, we circle it with CD, and we get AC minus BD. Okay, this is our new product on vectors. With respect to this product, we've got that uh, the vector and its derivative are orthogonal, O orthogonal or circle orthogonal, um, with respect to this sort of interesting uh, vector product. Okay, so let's see where this leads. Right, if we've got that these are circle orthogonal, then we need that these terms cancel each other out somehow. Right, so we need that this cancels out to zero, and the only way that can happen is if they uh, match up. Right, so we need that uh, the derivative of x is y, and the derivative of y is x, right? The only way that we can get this to, to zero out is if the terms switch places. Okay, and then we could scale. Now, let's suppose that P has circle unit speed. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that the length of the derivative with respect to the circle product uh, looks like this. We can plug in 
uh, the definition of the derivative there, keeping track of that lambda just like we did with the circle. We pull the lambdas out. And notice that this term here, right, this term has to be 1 because we've assumed x squared minus y squared is negative 1. And that's equivalent to y squared minus x squared is 1. Okay, so a bit of notation there. Uh, but the point is that this, this lambda, y, uh, lambda t comes out all on its own. Okay, so just like we had before, lambda t has to be positive 1 or negative 1. And we're going to assume that it's always positive 1. So our unit speed path gives us the following hypothesis. We've got that the derivative of x must be y and the derivative of y must be x. Okay, they have to switch roles. So we've got a system of differential equations that our path has to satisfy. And this is a little bit simpler. Here, the path closes up after two derivatives. Right, so here, our pattern repeats after two derivatives. Okay, we'll pick an initial point. We'll take power series. So here are our power series. And notice that this is going to repeat on the even terms. So the zeroth derivative, the second derivative, and the fourth derivative all have to agree. And we've got that x of 0 is 0. Okay. Similarly, these guys all have to agree. And we've got that y of 0 is 1. Okay, so let's see where that gets us. Right, plugging in our uh, our values, we get that x only has odd terms. And y only has even terms. Okay. So these might not be the most familiar functions, but I want to point out uh, an interesting property that these functions have. So if we add these up, right, we're going to get uh, all terms of the following form. Right? And that's going to be the exponential function. Okay, so the, these two functions, when we combine them together, give us an exponential function. And that's going to be helpful for the exercise that follows at the end. Okay, so we've got a parameterization. Right, so what's the, what is this saying? This is saying that if we start off at the origin, We move out to a point, right? We're going to get to x of t, y of t. And in some sort of odd sense, that's going to be orthogonal to our derivative. Okay, so our derivative is going to come out and be orthogonal with respect to the. Um, circle product. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what that orthogonality means and how to generalize this to higher dimensions. Uh, but what we've got is a parameterization of the hyperbola that is very, very similar to the parameterization of the unit circle that we got previously. Okay, so as a checkup, I'd like you to plot the parameterization that we got for the hyperbola and see that it matches up with the the hyperbola that we said it that we said it did, and 
uh, find some closed formulas for x of t and y of t. Okay? Try and find a formula that doesn't involve an infinite series for these guys. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to discuss these things further when we get into hyperbolic geometry.